Dobby and Fred, y'all can have a seat. Anywhere. Oh, yeah, I, 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 yeah. We talked at length. That's right. Don't be. Okay. We got one more. I want to say good evening to everyone. Did everybody have a great Thanksgiving? I am delighted to be here this evening. Um, I want to give my thanks to Dean Littles for making this happen, as well as Dean Chapin, who's not here right now. And special thanks to the founders of the Civil Rights Institute, Fred and Dobby Flowers. I see Terry Davis. Um, John is out with COVID, so he's not here. Um, Katie, Bridget, um, Susanna, Gail, just trying to remember everybody um, who put the effort in, who was the architect, the foundation for the Institute. Um, the Civil Rights Institute is here. It's, it's real, it's, in, it's important, it's, it's for the students, it's for the campus, it's for the community. And um, I'm thankful to be the director of the Florida State University Civil Rights Institute. The, um, the reason we're having this is just pretty much an introduction to, to know who Ted Ellis is, um, my passion, my purpose, my commitment, my drive. And, um, and then we're gonna lead in with the, um, the vision and the mission of the Institute. Where do we plan to go from here? And when we talk about the, the road or the journey to justice, what does that look like? Um, for me, it started years ago. I remember 1993, I did this piece called Justice. And um, at the time, it was a, a, a lot of um, um, fighting, murders between African-American males, the Bloods and the Crips. And um, there was a special on, on the news um, in, in the newspaper, the Houston Chronicle. And I, had, I wrote in, and I, and I called in. And I, um, uh, and I told him, I said, well, you know, tell my story. I'm, Middle management, I'm in corporate America, I grew up in the hood, I didn't do any drugs, I'm, I'm a functional African American male, I take care of my family. I said, tell that story, I said, because more underserved um, people need to, need to see constructive stories of, of themselves. And um, well, I, I didn't get much of a, um, a reaction from that, so I decided to, to use my passion. My passion is to paint. And I, I wind up creating this painting, Justice. It, um, it caught the eye of, of several attorneys um, at the National Bar Convention in Seattle. I subsequently wind up doing a whole series on African Americans in the legal profession. The uh, mayor of New Orleans at the time was um, Mark Moriel. He had the whole exhibition at the, um, at the City Hall in New Orleans. It went to Southern University's Law School. And that was sort of my foundation on being very purposed in my passion, um, how I was going to exact change um, um, in that area of activism and, and equity. That piece is called Champions of Justice. And um, you, know, um, you know, never thought or imagined that I would be in this position as the director of the Institute um, in the capacity of building programming to reach the next generation of futures that's going to impact our communities. This piece, um, I wind up doing of um, President Barack Obama. We unveiled it at the French Embassy in Washington, D.C. It was sponsored by the National Publishing Association and the National Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, 
we didn't get a chance to see the um, the president. He didn't he didn't visit our um, gala, but just to to know that I had an opportunity to to showcase and to make an impact, and subsequently receive f um, funding from his administration to do the good work. This particular painting that you see is free at last. Um, it was showcased in Washington D.C. for the 150th anniversary of Juneteenth. Um, John Cornyn. Um, sponsored um, that opportunity at the Rotunda. Sam Collins is a local activist in um, Hitchcock, Texas, but very active in, in, in the efforts of getting Juneteenth recognized as a federal holiday. And then that's in a Rotunda with my Juneteenth um, Freedom um, Project. It was amazing because the exhibition was up for a whole week and we had dignitaries and folks from all over the world to come in and, um, and, and see and engage around the importance of, of, of Juneteenth. And Juneteenth in Texas was June 19th when General Gordon Granger came in with, with the, um, the, the, the letter to law, executive order um, number three, and said cease and desist slavery is over with. And um, in 1865, that was that day. And to see in 17 years of, of putting the good work in um, watching it become the, the um, 11th federal holiday. Two years ago, that was an uh, interview um, with CNN. It was 43 international markets um, that it was televised in around Juneteenth being recognized as the 11th federal holiday and um, recognized by the city, county, and the state, as well as the federal government as the art ambassador for the 11th federal holiday. So those are one of my wonderful high marks in, um, in understanding the, um, the importance of advocacy through art, the advocacy of, of culture, um, that, that, that we can make the impact. Uh, you know, art says nothing, but it says everything. Um, you just have to have the opportunity to, um, to be able to present. And that's at the state capitol, um, the state of Texas. That was the only place where the exhibition hadn't been in home. And so on its last leg, um, um, Senator Cornyn had it um, at the um, state capitol. 1999, um, I was at the NAACP convention. I was a judge for the NAACP AXO program for students who are in the process of competing um, for, for art and for, for other areas centered around um, you know, social studies. And I was a judge. And I was actually had a, had a booth that I was displaying my art, and we had students in that area, but we also had representatives from Walt Disney. And they came in and they asked if I was interested in competing for this wonderful opportunity to be the, um, what do you say, the, the first artist that Walt Disney was celebrating, and celebrate African American culture. So 1999, I had that opportunity to present and create that poster for Walt Disney. If you stepped on that campus in 1999, all of the artwork that I had, particularly this poster, was featured throughout the whole campus. And I thought um, we had Alfred Woodard there, Danny Glover, and several other celebrities. And um, I was the, the, the featured person um, centered around celebrating and commemorating the importance of, of African American history and culture. And I, I thought, then that, you know, what a wonderful opportunity to be in. Now, this particular project was sponsored by Oshner Hospital as well as Blue Claws Blue Shield. And we had the five mayors of the five largest, five largest cities in the state of Louisiana. That poster went into almost every um, um, school and throughout Louisiana. And I thought when we talked about the importance of education, the, the importance of, 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 of impacting in history and corporate sponsorship, that was a phenomenal project um, that was endorsed by two major um, corporations. And here, um, that's Mr. Cornell West. Those are members of, of Merrill Lynch when he came to um, Houston and Galveston, and I had presented him with the Tuskegee Airmen. And I talked to him about the importance of, of cultural advocacy and the monetization of culture and getting African-American art recognized as a, as a national treasure. And he said, ah, oh, that's, that's interesting, Mr. Ellis. 
but we had great conversation. I thought this was appropriate um, to have this piece called The Healers since we were right here in this wonderful space. I have a whole series on, on African Americans in the medical profession the same way I approach the, um, the African Americans in, in the legal profession. One of the other roles that I, 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 and hats that I wear, I am a federal commissioner under the auspices and oversight of the National Park Services Department of Interior. 400 years of African American history under public law 115-102 and celebrating and commemorating the contributions of African Americans since 1619. Now, Dolly Flowers will say, Ted, you know, we've been here a lot longer than 1619 if we just look at St. Augustine and that conversation. But the, 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 the role when you imagine that, when 20 or so enslaved Africans arrived on a white line ship in Fort, in, in Fort Monroe um, in Virginia, from the arc of 1619, over 40 million African Americans here in the United States. And the public law, we have not sunset it yet as a federal commission, but our responsibility is to continue to celebrate and commemorate the contributions of African Americans here in the United States. And this was, was one of the events that we had in Washington, D.C., that we had over 200 students around the um, Washington, D.C. Um, Metroplex to come on in. Um, our program lasted about two hours. Um, the students were totally engaged. We uh, understood the importance of pushing it forward, that it, it resides with giving that opportunity to the future to our students. And so um, that's... Um, Part of my journey on my magic carpet as an artist, you know, I always say, you know, you get on your carpet and you never know where it's going to take you. But with good intentions um, and with passion and purpose, opportunity presents itself not only for yourself but for others as well. So when we talk about the CRI, the Civil Rights Institute, the, the mission and the vision, yes, the mission is to continue to celebrate and commemorate the importance of the civil rights movement, um, past and present and looking to the future, but also to engage social change. And um, with Joe, since I'm in the um, Gus Stavros Center building, I talked about economic activism, and I think that was the last leg what Dr. King was talking about. And uh, I can get a bit all over the place and, and want to get things done. Um, Joe said, Ted, remember who's your who, and, and, and focus, stay focused in that area of engagement. I could tell you three things that I really want to get done inside this institution to make impact, and that's one is to gain the trust of the student body as well as the faculty, but to definitely engage the students uh, to see how important it is as it relates to civil rights and human rights. Civil rights is the capacity in which we have the ability to, to equitably promote and gain opportunity to advance our human capital, our human worth, and also to, to understand the importance and the value of democracy. So, so having this institute on this campus is critical. It is, by my research, the only institute in the 12 university system um, in, the, in the state of Florida. That's to be commended to have that kind of vision and tenacity to place something here on this campus to preserve and to recognize how important our rights are. And when we're talking about our rights, you're talking about um, human um, incarceration, human trafficking, you're talking about the LGBT community, you're talking about the, the, the ability to touch everyone's lifestyle, race, ethnicity, um, that, that capacity even on, on income, and on, on the opportunity to earn income. That this Civil Rights Institute will be the premier institute in advancing the importance of, of our rights. And we think about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. We talk about capitalism, and we also talk about slavery. This particular piece that I did, I had you know, sugar, cotton, tobacco, and rice. I used to always say the four major um, um, commodities that drove the global commerce of slavery. But the most important one was the chattel um, in the middle. 
and you see the, the, the flag, the pain, sweat, blood, and tears like it's, it's bleeding. 16, 19, 18, um, 65, when you had close to 10, I want to say um, 10 million souls lost through the Middle Passages. Uh, that still affects the policies and the letter of the law that has happened right now here in America. That's a reason why we, we, we see the importance of the, the Civil Rights Institute. Plessy versus Ferguson, that's 1896, but in 1823, we had the free colored people of St. Augustine. Um, when we talk about the level of engagement around, uh, around freedom, around justice, it predates what we have right now as we talk about the early contemporary civil rights movement. Moving forward is the CRI educational activism and advocacy. And this quote, Nelson Mandela talks about, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. And that starts right here. This is a research one institution. Um, 40,000 students that we see on this campus that, that we have to gain their trust. And we gain, their, we gain their trust by presenting the right kind of evidence, the, the truth that's necessary to advance where they want to go at the end of the day so that they can make the kind of impact that will be constructive, that will be positive, and will improve their lifestyle as they continue to move forward. That's Carter G. Woodson. This painting talks about his whole struggle. One of the things that I look at um, um, creating is a civil rights symposium here on this campus, that we would have the subject matter experts that are right here on this campus to talk about what are the things that we need to address in this space as it relates to civil rights and pushing that forward. <coughs> That'll happen within the first year. The um, second year, I look to have the inclusion of other academic institutions, universities, throughout the, um, the, the state system. And then in the third year, to branch out on a national platform of engagement. The civil rights movement, if we look at the modern day civil rights movement, which lasted about close to about, I want to say about 12 years, um, that piece of engagement and talking about the impact in Florida, in Tallahassee, through the panhandle from Jackson to from, um, Jacksonville to Pensacola, from Miami to Tallahassee. What does that look like in documenting that story? <coughs> with providing the right kind of research, with the right kind of student engagement, and the capacity to put together this exhibition that will travel throughout the state of Florida and throughout the United States. Just recently, I had a chance to um, visit St. Augustine that's the St. Augustine uh, Foot Soldiers Monument, but we also know I'm a man, equal rights for all, one man, one vote. January, January 15th, that is gonna be our hard opening of the Civil Rights Institute. That is when we're gonna celebrate and we're gonna tell our story, our whole plan of execution for the Civil Rights Institute. Further examines the civil rights contributions of Congressman John Lewis and other civil rights activists, a CRI student research and curriculum project. I think that'll be a great piece to engage the students, to reach out to those who are on this campus, who have graduated, those who have worked on this campus, and those in the community. It also gives an opportunity to bridge with FAMU as well, with their archives and their records. And so this is gonna be a very exciting project along with the oral histories project um, that I think that is gonna be phenomenal in the sense that we're gonna start right here with, with capturing the history of Florida State University. I think the other piece of it is, is how well we collaborate and we work in partnership with the other institutes and centers on the campus. That's gonna be a big piece um, in, in that level of engagement. Uh, we're very young in this space. We're, we're, we're making wonderful gumbo or wonderful stew, but that takes time. If you're, if you're stirring the pot, it takes time for it to, to all come together and coalesce. The same thing with the Civil Rights Institute. It's gonna take a time, it's gonna take the effort, and it's gonna take the dedication 
to really make this work. This soft opening is primarily for us to, to get a chance to, to meet Ted Ellis. Uh, it's give me, it gives me the opportunity to ask for your help in that process. You know, I want to reach out to, and continue to reach out to the student organization. The power of we, the um, Black Student um, um, Union, um, the, um, I think it's the, the, the Center for um, Student Leadership and Engagement, another organization. You know, what does that look like in that capacity? I mean, when we talk about underserved communities, how does that impact in the, in the medical area? Um, how can we address those needs and those concerns through the Civil Rights Institute? How do we bridge in partnership with, with other um, um, organizations that are on other campuses um, like UCLA or the Civil Rights um, International Museum in Greensboro, um, North Carolina? So there's a lot of work to do um, in that space. Um, two of the main things I want to get started with is gaining the trust of the students and working out students' projects. That's an oral history project. That's a project in which we um, find out at its very core the civil rights history of Florida State University. And then with that, we, we continue to build um, other opportunities and, and areas centered around civil rights engagement. So I'm going to end there and open up the floor to questions um, um, or comments in this space. Okay, so for the Civil Rights Institute, our primary means will just, by all historical accounts, um, you know, I, I had a couple of um, interviews and one of the focuses on pr primary resources, you know, sticking to the facts, stick, sticking to historical facts. Um, I mean, once you have that, then you don't have to address anything else. You just stay in that particular lane. I mean, that's what we're going to do. So when I, when I approach the archives um, here at Florida State University and FAMU, when I uh, have that conversation with the um, Florida Historical Society and the State Museum as it, as it relates to civil rights engagement and, and objects and artifacts, then, then you can't refute that, you can't argue with that. I mean, that's, it is what it is at the end of the day. And so, so coupled with that, understanding that, and then having, having the, um, the intent the desire, the want to do the right thing for all the right reasons, then you just move it forward. And, and you just sort of don't worry about those other things that, that other folks are dealing with, you know, when you're dealing in, in the truth. And when you're responsible for the right reasons, when you think about this academic institution, what it's here for, it's, it's, it's a learned opportunity for the students to engage, okay? So you're gaining trust. You're, you're, you're being factual in, in, in that response. And so I'm doing all the right things that, for all the right reasons inside an academic institution. So that's, that's, that's where you, you drive your wedge at. And that's what I plan on doing with the Civil Rights Institute. Well, thank you. Thank you. When you first started the act of making art with such historical uh, premise to it, were you confident that it would carry such weight, that it would take you where you are now as a person in the academic world? Do you feel as if your art really, at the beginning, did you really think your art would grasp people or were you just doing it because you knew that it was something that you wanted to do? That's a great question. And I got a, I got a couple of answers for that. And I, if, I, if I can go way back on um, my influences. I, mean, I grew up in New Orleans. Uh, when I was old enough, I, could, I would take public transit. I would go to the French quarters. And in Jackson Square, you had all the artists. And I had a thousand questions. I was just, just tall and size 13s. And say, here's this little black kid with his, with his big old feet with a thousand questions. And, uh, but you know, I was always curious, and I just watched how folks would engage the artists from, um, um, and these, these folks were all over the world. 
and each artist has something to say with their kind of art. And I was mesmerized with that. I mean, it didn't say nothing, but it was just images that they painted. And I would leave there and I would go to the public library on Loyola Street and check out books and get into world book encyclopedias and that would take me all over the world, learn about Leonardo da Vinci and, and so forth. And, um, and, and that, 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 that drove me very early that I could speak and, and, and my art would resonate in, 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 in that space. Um, then I started reading a little bit more, and I started reading about the black art movement with Amari Baraki, and I, I looked at what Jacob Lawrence and Romare Bearden were doing with their art, Elizabeth Catlett, the social justice, social engagement through the art. And I, and I, and I watched how Jacob Lawrence painted in series, the Toussaint Low Overture series, his migration series, his, his educational series and stuff like that. I said, hmm. I said, wow, I, I, I can do that. I can do it my kind of way. And um, when I showed the justice piece, it, that's when it really hit, you know, um, the impact of that piece, going to the National Bar Convention and seeing how the artists were responding um, across the board. And then I was, to my surprise, the America Trial Lawyers Association um, appointed the first African-American of the trial lawyers. It was in Chicago, and they asked me to come and put my exhibition up. And I saw everybody engage in my art. And I just sat back and just watched. And it was one time, another time, in, in, in Memphis, Tennessee, at the Peabody Hotel. We had <laughs> Willie Gary, Johnny Cochran, um, Sweet. You had all these attorneys, high profile attorneys. And my boot was right next to the registration area. And I happened to have the original justice piece up. And all the attorneys, came in my booth and said, I have that piece in my office, I have that piece in my office, that piece in my office. And I just said, wow, how about that? Look at the impact of art. And um, um, Willie Gary came up and hugged me and stuff like that and was like, you know, I was, I was, I was high on the hog. It was an exciting moment for me. And, um, and, I, and I, knew, I knew that then what I was doing was critically important and I knew I could touch people. Um, there's some things in here when Avon came calling. I, I sold close to um, uh, 400,000 prints through Avon's distribution. That went throughout the whole world. I mean, that was a, a, a major impact economically for my family and having that contract for over 10 years. But when I think about the images of um, worship in the house, the baptism, you know, I was painting about my culture, my history, my identity and I was impacting this major multi-billion dollar corporation the same way I did with Walt Disney. So I understood the economic importance of art, but also the importance of culture. And then growing in that capacity, you know, you're still learning, you're learning as you go. I went back to school, I majored in chemistry at Dillard University, then 20 years later, I went and got my master's in museum studies at Southern University in New Orleans. But in between that time, you know, for almost 30 years, I've been engaging communities, cultural institutions, museums, corporation. Uh, a few years ago, I was at Lytos Corporation. That's a top 10 defense firm in Reston, Virginia. I was with their C-suiters. They um, videoed the whole thing through all the major corporations and went out to 12,000 employees. But, but you understand, and that was centered around Juneteenth with my um, Juneteenth Champions um, exhibition. Um, you know, when we look at the impact of, of, of policy and we look at the impact of letter to law, the precursor is culture. If your culture is not there, if there's no respectability for your culture, that language and conversation is not going to be exacted in that bill that turns into that letter to law. So I understood that very early and I understood that it was also a wonderful currency, a cultural currency, an economic currency. If you look at every major museum in the United States, it's in a high center of commerce and trade. So if you look at Washington, D.C., you look at New York, you look at Boston, you look at Houston, um, Chicago, Miami, six major epic centers. All of them have major museums, 70% federally funded, 30% by private corporation, high in philanthropy. And those are images in there about culture and identity. When you look at the major um, auction houses, if you look at Sotheby's and Christie's, um, close to about um, almost half a trillion dollars, you know, on celebrating culture. 
And culture in that regards is unregulated. It is what you say it is. And so when you see a, a painting of Michelangelo, um, Leonardo da Vinci, um, um, Andy Warhol, you know, you see paintings that are worth $100 million, $200 million. But you also understand that, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a driving mechanism for economics. It's a driving mechanism for, for policy. It's a driving mecha mechanism for preserving history. And so when I think about you know, civil rights and I look at it and I say, you know, there's a piece that's missing to this equation. You know, the cultural advocacy and cultural activism and using every area of the arts uh, in respect to the creatives. That's music, that's dance, um, that's that's the um, the visual arts in that capacity. You know, I foresee at some point in time that we have a major civil rights um, festival here, concert. You know, that's in time. That that'll that'll build. So, um, but the students will have a lot to say in that, and um, and, and and so I'm, I'm happy to to be involved and get them engaged in that process, so that t they take ownership in it. So, I, um, you know. I'm here to serve. You know, when, when, when I talked to um, my dean, Tim, he said, Ted, what is that you want to do? I said, oh, I just want to leave a wonderful legacy. It's, it's, it's at that point in time. You know, what am I going to do? How am I going to impact um, these students, that, that our leaders? I mean, because they're going to touch every part of, of society. They're going to be the politicians, the, the business owners, um, the educators out here. And if we can't get them involved right now, then then, then we're not doing what we need to do. And if we can't be brave and bold in, in, in that space and, and, and tackling the tough, hard issues, then, then we're in the wrong business. And if this is gonna be the kind of um, thought leader and leadership in an institution, um, the way Fred and Dobby has fought to, to make sure that this is, a lot of times, I, I, you, know, um, you know, Dobby, I, I, I'm just gonna say it, I, 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 I love your commitment. I love your tenacity. Fred, the same thing here. You know, I, I mentioned, I said, I said, whatever your mom put in you, they put some good stuff in you, you know, to be committed uh, around equity, around equality, around justice. It's so much, it's so much needed, particularly at this time. You know, when I, I, had, I had other options, I didn't have to come to this institution. But when I came here, they, they were sincere, they were committed, they were intentional. I knew what they did prior to it when I came in. That was 2018 when they had the, the first rollout of it and I had my art in the background. I never imagined I'd be sitting here and be the director of the Civil Rights Institute. But you know, um, I, I think God has, has some funny humor and, and laughter. I sit at the federal level of a federal commission that has, has been extended for five years. That's the 400 years of African American history um, commission. I see intimately at the federal level how business is done with the National Park Services and Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture. I see it every day. I get about 20 emails um, in communication from my executive director. And to say that is probably the most important federal commission representing African American interests interest since the Freedmen's Bureau Commission of 1865 speaks volumes. Yes, an artist is the acting chair of that federal commission. An artist is the director of the Civil Rights Institute. I will say, you know, Opal Lee um, in 2016, she was campaigning um, to get Juneteenth recognized as a federal holiday. She had a million folks to sign, I think. But I also understood one year earlier, I was in Washington, D.C. on the House and Senate side campaigning for Juneteenth as a, as a national holiday. And 17 years of good work in that space. Now, there's a, let me see if I can get to it. Are we, are we familiar with these folks here? I started this job, this opportunity in June 9th. But these are the um, four individuals. They were teenagers and were arrested um, in um, 1963 in St. Augustine. Um, I just found the photo of Samuel White, which, was, which took some work um, through the St. Augustine Historical Society. The, um, the reporter from the, um, the newspaper in St. Augustine. Um, um, we have um, Miss Edwards here. Um, we have Joanne. Um, 
what's Joanne's last name anyway? Um, Joanne, and we have um, um, Will Singleton. But these two are still living. The two gentlemen are, are, are deceased right now. But, um, you know, that's part of that history when we talk about the St. Augustine for that's my Freedom Rides piece. Um, for the 50th anniversary by the city of Selma, Alabama, and the mayor and the city council, they commissioned me to do that piece. That's Rosa Parks piece. I had the Rosa Parks um, Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, Shirley Chisholm, who was the first female to run for president. Um, that was my Our Time Has Come piece when George Floyd uh, was killed. That uh, piece pretty much went viral um, on, the, on the internet. And um, another one of my social justice pieces, we know that the 60th anniversary of the um, Civil Rights Act is in June of, um, of next year. This piece I did um, this year f to recognize the 60th March on Washington, um, D.C. Um, and this has been my, my quiet campaign. Um, I do believe that one person can make a difference. You know, you throw um, a pebble in the pond and, and you can do it. So I thought about how do we make things work? You talked about, you know, um, the challenges in, in Florida. And I see challenges, I also see opportunities. But in my research as a chemist, to analyze and observe, I noticed that the um, state of Florida had the um, Civil Rights Hall of Fame and they've inducted 27 individuals in the um, Civil Rights Hall of Fame. Uh, when the last time they had it, it was on this campus at the stadium. And so I called up Mr. Pinella and asked him, you know, who were the next three honorees and where were they going to have the, um, the next um, program? And um, he said, well, a couple of things. He said, we're challenged with the budget. It's not one of our line items. And I offered the opportunity for the Civil Rights Institute to step in that space. I had not told him that I had been painting these individuals. All 27 are painting. I painted close to about 40 individuals as it relates to civil rights activism inside the state of Florida. I look at that as an opportunity to bridge between Florida State University and the state of Florida as a part of a traveling exhibition and recognition. So when I say that, you know, from an artist's um, um, mind and, 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 and what I see, I, I see us finding a solution. I see us finding an opportunity. And in that collection, you have African Americans, you have Hispanics, you have Caucasians who have been active in, in that space. I, I imagine seeing that exhibition in Washington, D.C. at the National Portraiture Gallery, you know, sponsored by Florida State University and um, the, the um, state of Florida. That's the potential I see. I always see a way as an artist and, a, and an opportunity. So when you come inside of an institution that has you know, 40,000 assets, you know, on top of it. That's, that's the human capital in this space. If I can gain your trust the way institutions do, the way libraries do, the way museums do, the way some corporations do with their brand, their trust and stuff like that, we can push it forward. And so I think Dobby and Fred and the architects behind the Civil Rights Institute, you know, for giving me this chance to prove my worth and my value and my passion to bring some good work, some good work as a good example of what we ought to be doing. You know, I sit and I contemplate, what do we ought to be doing? You know, that, particularly with our politicians, because the politicians are, 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 are in a sense, representing us. Because if we think about democracy, the power is in each of the individuals who have the right to vote, and, and, we, and we elect these officials to represent us. And the level of conversation, the polarization, is not what's needed as we try to advance the importance of our human worth and our human capital in the space. And so um, the way that's going to happen, the way I see it, is, is, to, is, to, is to have the participation of the students. Um, the professors, the faculty in the space, that's part of what this soft opening is. Tim says, hey, we just need to get an opportunity to, um, to, for, for you to make an introduction and for folks to get to know you and who you are. 
and, and what you want to get accomplished. And I won't profess I know everything. I just about. <laughs> but I need your help. I need your help. I need your support. And I, and, and I will tell you, I will not let you down in that campaign. I just think about, you know, um, just the sacrifice. I've, I've, been, I've, I've been this sort of um, lone ranger, you know, champion African-American culture. I, I paint it, I think about it, I strategically figure out what I'm going to say with my art, what I wanted to say. And I step back and I just let it go ahead and see what it does. But I get in that van, I used to get in that white van, and we'll go to La Jolla, California. We'll go to um, Schenectady, New York. You know, we'll go to Miami. And, and, and a lot of times when I would come to Miami, there was this family would open up their doors to me and it says, like, like I was a little stray or something, come on in, let me feed you, you know, let me invite some folks over so that they can see your art and, and commit it. And, and one time I, and I was just inquisitive, I came to this campus and I saw these sculptures. And they had not said anything about this in our conversation on their commitment of service, service to community, you know, service to humanity. And um, I just like, wow, you know, these, these two stalwarts in this capacity um, who are committed for wanting to do the right thing. And, um, and Davi said, I was at Southern University at New Orleans, and another university was calling me. It was North Carolina a and And um, they said, we want you to come and run both of our galleries up here, Ted Ellis. We believe in you. And, uh, and I was just talking to him. Dom said, well, you know, we're going to be interviewing for the director of the Civil Rights Institute. I said, yeah. And I said, you know, I'm going to come. I'm going to come and just as a kindness, you know, uh, and respect for Dobby and Fred and the work that they were doing. And I was blown away. I was blown away by the openness and the commitment uh, um, collectively, collectively in this community. And, um, and then I thought about the, the effort and the work to, to, to make change. Those two sculptures, you, f you will not find that the liking of that in any place in the United States are two living institutions that are celebrated. And if you, if you, if you look at the work, the continuous work, what they continue to do, it's, 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 it amazes. So when I was tired and sick and tired, wee hours of the night, and, I, and I, I have these portraits and I look at them and I know their history and I'm saying, wow, I'm, I'm right there in their spirit. Their sacrifice, we're here for just a short period, a short period to do good work, to leave that legacy. What will your legacy be? You know, what, what will your legacy be? And that's, that's an important piece and so, um, Hopefully, the kind of legacy and the kind of examples ahead of me in, in service and in, in, in commitment to do the right thing, that, that I leave a, a, a mark that will sustain itself, will perpetuate itself. Somebody else will take it on and move it forward. Um, when I'm in Washington, D.C., and um, this February we'll be back in Washington, D.C., uh, hopefully we get a chance to... Uh, meet the president and the vice president in that capacity. But in the summer times, when you see the future and you see these bus loads of students coming in on the hill um, and learning the intimacies of how government works, you know, uh, bear in mind, it's about preserving your rights. Preserving your rights. This Civil Rights Institute is for all of us, and we all need to be actively engaged in it. We need to provide the right kind of service. So, so those who have had the vision and tenacity to see that and to put it forward, I couldn't say no. I had to come to this institution and, and do the good work and, 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 and put in the good fight for what's necessary. You know, I was telling Joe and his, um, and the Gustavo, I said, you know, there's some humor. I said, you know, because I got this funny inclination about, you know, civil rights and economic empowerment and where that's gonna go, and how do we monetize that? And I was thinking about you know, the traveling exhibition and, 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 and corporate sponsorship getting behind that, you know, scholarships being evolved off of that. You know, who's going to eventually buy the, the, the exhibition if we do decide to sell it? How is that gonna impact the universe? Dabe, I was hearing you. 
I just had my own kind of way on what I wanted to do with it. But, 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 but how do we make that sacrifice for the greater good so that we can continue to put out a better product? The better product is not how much money we make. The better product is how better we can make a human being. And, um, and that's what we have to live for. My responsibility at this age is for the very young who are underneath me and, and the very old. That's my responsibility. And uh, you know, I have um, some gifts that the Lord has given me um, to be able to use to, to um, advance that and, um, and, and to make things happen in a wonderful, constructive manner. And if I can be that example for others in that space to find your passion, um, to use your passion for a greater good, then, then that, that will be my legacy. That will be my legacy. And, you know, um, um, it has not failed me. It has not failed me in, in my journey on my magic carpet. It took me almost 60 years to get to Florida State University. I'm here. I'm here now. I ain't going any place. And we, Terry, we're going to continue to do the good work. We're going to have those oysters and stuff like that. Davis, I know you're chomping at the bit. And you're like, Ted, you'd be you know, coaxing me. And Ted, come on, now talk to me now. What's the next move? I, I have things I want to share with you. Good people in this space, good people in this space um, that care, care about our future, care about our students who are sitting back here. Where's Rodney? There you go, he's over there. SGA president and stuff like that. E enthusiastic. I'm going to do everything I can to help you, man. And, and, and where you want to go, you know, your, your path to greatness. You claim it, you own it. And then we're going to put everything that we can into that to make that happen. And I, I, I pledge that. I pledge that for every student. I get up there in my office. Um, Joe has given me a great office. I get to look out there and I look at the potential of the future. You know, they're on their little skateboards, they're walking back and forth. I said, President of the University, you know, Vice President of this corporation, Pastor of this church, like this. All the potential and possibilities. The only time we fail is when we quit. That's the only time. Anytime we have the, the, the life within us, we have to continue, continue to reach and to stretch to do good. My, my mom was on her dying bed, and um, you know she says, "You you got to do this. You got to do that." I said, "Mom, all I'm doing is worrying about you right now." But, but, but what she was getting to was you, you got to put yourself in service. And, and, and it got to be in, in service that it's not just about yourself. It's, it's about to others. And that's where we make the change. That's where we make the good change, the continuous change. And so, you know, from this little old artist, from the Lower Night War to Washington, D.C., um, ambassador, official art ambassador. That's by Senator John Cornyn and Congressman Randy Weber at the federal level as the art ambassador for Juneteenth, acting chair of the Federal 400 Commission, director of the Civil Rights Institute, an artist, how about that? So whatever your dream is, whatever your inclination is, with passion, with conviction, with purpose, you can do it, you can make it happen. So I thank you guys, thank you very much. And I need your help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Yes. Any more questions? Go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, um, this institution is, is prime. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's been percolating. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, it has everything that you need. We're in Tallahassee. We're, we're ground zero. What better place to make your mark and to speak and to change minds and, and hearts in that capacity? I mean, so, you, you, I mean, my example when I said, you know, we were sponsored in Washington, D.C. by John Cornyn and Randy Weber. The, the, they, they weren't left wing at all. 
but they understood how important the work, the sacrifice in that. That's a, that's a, a, a you know, human inclination, human response, you know, um, uh, respect for ideology, respect for culture. And, and so, you know, as this university continues to expand and it's expanding internationally, you know, not just nationally. I mean, this, this is a healthy institution. This is a growing institution. And, and, and so um, they got it right when they said, you know what, we're going to establish this civil rights institute here. We're going to get it started and, and we're going to grow it. And, and, and we're going to use, the, the arts idea wasn't just my idea. Dobby has a tremendous inclination for the arts. Fred does too in capacity. And, and, and so, you know, with, with, with that, they say, okay, you know, we're going to move the needle. We're going we're gonna to push it forward. And, uh, you know, not being braggadocious, but, 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 but I've been out here on the street, you know, engaging multi-billion dollar corporations, cultural institutions, political institutions, with the advocation of using art to make that happen. And so, so, so we, we're not going to change anything. That's going to be the playbook. And we're going to get the students in, involved in that. You know, um, the, the, the plain air opportunity, I'm thinking about, you know, how do we pull that off in February and how's the weather going to be when we ask the students and the faculties to, you know, to paint about civil rights. And, and that becomes part of, of, of an exhibition, part of a conversation. And so, so those, are, those, are, those are other elements to the art piece, uh, I mean, on the theatrical piece in, in, in a play. I mean, imagine, you know, you got, you got 40 of these individuals, and each student grabs one of these individuals and talks about their history, and then talks about what they want to do and how they want to see the world change. And we hear from the mouth of our futures how they see themselves engaged in civil rights and activism here and now. Well, that, that Meeks archive over there, you know, we, we got we to gotta partner uh, with them with that. Uh, we got to engage the, um, the archives and collections here as well. And that's going to be a bridge between the student organizations. And I think one of the reaches is, is, is using the Black Student Union, the power of, of we to get them engaged in that process. Let that dialogue be, begin with them. Uh, you know, let us manage that conversation and be part of it. But, you know, you know, how do we get better? How, how do we do better? You know, we do better with the next generation. You know, Fred and Dobby, you guys have been working for a very long time in this space, you know, as an attorney. So, so the next progression is to get them engaged and get them involved in that. And so, you know, we, we're going to go over there and I'm um, going to say what I want to do, how I want to do it. And I'm going to leave it up to the students to, 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 to take ownership of the project. And, and, and that's, that's when you have total buy-in, when the students get in. Because all the work and all the ideas that we have, um, if, it, if it doesn't move beyond where I'm at, then w what good is it? You know, if nobody takes hold of it, the next generation takes hold of it. I um, came out of um, St. Augustine with the um, Stetson Kennedy Foundation and brilliant minds. But all of them were, 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 were 75 and older. There was an, another next generation. So all of this wealth of information, this wealth of engagement is at a loss if, 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 if we don't have that level of participation for the next generation to come in. And so we got to work just as aggressively hard and get the engagement as we work in that strategic plan that is laid out in the strategic plan. So with FAMU, it's, it's getting the, 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 the student leadership um, involved in, the, in that process and in, in, in bridging. Um, will it be easy? It, it may not. But we got to put the effort um, into that. I just wanted to say, um, on behalf of um, Dean Chapin and the College of um, Social Sciences and Public Policy, as well as the College of Medicine, um, thank you so much for um, sharing um, with us. We were all very curious, so really appreciate it um, your sharing that with us. And thank you all for coming um, out in the atrium here at the College of Medicine. So thank you. Thank you, Dean. Levis. Good. Did you reach out to um, to um, Rich Gallup?